as I went down and um, it seemed to be some sort of puppet film. And um, I said, well, can I help? And they said, here, put on this elephant suit, stand in the corner. And so I did and basically stayed there for the five days of the shoot. And what that was, that was the prototype version of Meet the Feebles. It was the beginning of an association with director Peter Jackson that would lead George into the uncharted territory of 3D animation and live action film with heavenly creatures. I had no idea how much would be required and what sort of level you would have to work up to. There were shots in the film that Peter wanted that I was never able to achieve because it was just me and a single workstation and everything had to be done by me because there was no more money, there was no more gear. So it was just basically I sat in the room for about a year doing the stuff. Um, the only half day off I had was Christmas Day when Peter managed to lure me out to his house for a few hours to celebrate with him. Heavenly Creatures was the birth of Weta, the special effects company responsible for the magic of Lord of the Rings. In the beginning, George Fort ran the digital, or computer side, with model master Richard Taylor managing the physical special effects. It was the start of a series of amazing leaps forward in digital animation in New Zealand. Weta went on, under Richard Taylor, to blur the line completely between filmed and animated entertainment. We've always realised that to tell the stories in our heads, especially the stories in Peter's head, that we were going to have to push technology to a, great, a greatly farther degree than what we were working with at the time. And as a package within that, of course, is animation. Okay, and no. part of that animation is something unique to New Zealand. Now, this may not look much like Lord of the Rings, but take it from me, it's massive. Truly, that's the name of the software. These guys are trying to stay off the green, and they're trying not to bump into each other. They do occasionally bump into each other, which is why they turn red. I think it, they sort of get a bit angry when they, someone bumps into them. Now, it might sound a bit oversimplified, but if you film a few hundred orcs, set the animators to work for Facet, before you know it, you've got the biggest battle scenes ever filmed. And as massive inventor Stephen Regulus explains, these guys do actually think for themselves. You can't predict what the massive agents are going to do. Um, you can control them to some extent, but in as much as a real crowd, you don't know exactly what every single person's going to do in detail. You can still give them directions and get generally what you want, and then you can be a little more specific with some people if you want to be. So it's, it's very similar to using a real crowd. And alongside that, the Weta Wizards have given us Gollum, a complete synthesis of an actor and a digital character. I think it's the best thing that uh, I've ever done, certainly in regards to animation. Joe Letary is the visual effects supervisor for Weta Digital, leader of the team that brought Gollum to life, basing the character around the performance of actor Andy Serkis. And one of the first things we found out when we started putting Gollum into the scenes with Sam and Frodo is that the Gollum that we had from the Fellowship of the Rings couldn't act. He wasn't really designed as an actor, he was kind of designed as a creature. Now, he was designed before Andy Serkis was even cast. And so, in looking at Andy's performance and looking at Gollum, we realized that we had to bring Gollum more in line with Andy. So, we had to redesign him so he could perform what Andy could perform. I saved us. It was me. That was key because then you had a performer guiding the digital performance which meant she had a digital performer who could actually perform. And that's at the heart of all animated stories. If you don't believe in the character, then no amount of software will save it. Just ask any New Zealand animator how they feel about their characters. I became very defensive of the characters. I mean, you can't do that to Shrek, and Fiona would never do that, and just slowly found myself becoming more and more involved from this kind of protective sense. I'll kill that cat! <laughs> <laughs>
Shrek director Andrew Adamson might be a big name in Hollywood right now, but he started out doing graphics and commercials at home in New Zealand, which proved a pretty good training ground when he moved to the States in 1991. I went there initially thinking it was going to be a huge learning experience that I'd go into this company, which is one of the top companies in the world, and I'd get to learn all of these different things that I hadn't had the opportunity to learn in New Zealand. When I got there, I found it was actually a little the opposite, because it was kind of a one-man game here, and, uh, you know, most of the companies were very small. You had to do your own producing, your own system administration, write your own software, and do all your own animation. <laughs> Shrek was one of the films that breathed new life into the animated feature. Partly because of the computer technology, but maybe also because of a fresh approach from a down-under director. A lot of the rules were broken because I didn't know the rules. Um, it was the first movie I'd ever directed. Hadn't intended to do an animated movie, didn't come from that Disney background or anything. So I really just did things out of instinct. You know, and many people looking back at it say how did it work so well and if you'd ask them going in you know what do you think about putting the biggest action sequence right in the middle of the second act everyone would tell you that's a terrible flaw to make movie making wise you know from a formulaic perspective but i think part of that lack of formula is what actually appealed to people they were surprised and getting unexpected things at unexpected times within the movie <laughs> 